First Peter chapter 4. We're in a new chapter, which is exciting. Woo! We made it there. We're, we're, we're moving forward, but let's pray before we go any further in the encouragement series and just get in there. God, we pray a prayer of thanks. And as we dive into this uh, chapter 4 of, of First Peter, Lord, we pray that you'll just help us to be encouraged to, to live for you and to love for you and to just do that boldly. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So in the encouragement series, the, the goal is to give you uh, courage to live your faith in Jesus Christ out. And, and if you're not... If you're not a Christian, it's give you the courage to finally do that. And we're going to talk about some reasons why uh, here in a little bit. But um, when, when I was growing up, when I was, I was in high school, they had this class we always had to take. It was called Home Ec or Home Economics. That's where I learned how to make an apron. That's where I learned how to sew. That's where I learned how to make no-bake cookies. You know, all that stuff. Now it's called, maybe more appropriately, like, like life skills, right? So now you take this and you learn life skills. So you learn that when you're sharpening a knife, what do you do? You sharpen the knife away from you. You learn that when you're um, operating uh, different kind of things. This is old. This will date me super, super mega. But we learned how to balance a checkbook. Anybody ever remember checkbooks? Remember those? Yeah, they're like, you've got to learn how to balance a checkbook. How are you going to know what money you have? Because there were no apps back then. You know, it just was in the banks. And you had a, you, that was your app, was your piece of paper. So we learned how to do that. We learned how to read the stock market, all these life skills. And you could take some of these things that um, was like, uh, you know, farming. You learn how to do farming and operating. There was mechanics and woodworking. And we learned all these life skills because they wanted us to have the skills to get through life. And also to how to do things properly. So you learn all of that. I remember my dad teaching me um, uh, just re regular etiquette. Right? When you see a lady, you open the door for her. Which got super easy when they added the magnetic, the automatic doors. Because then you just had to stomp it or wave your hand and it just opened. Right? So we, I remember learning etics. And this is what the small fork is for. And this is what the big fork is for. And you don't want to do this because this, um, this could cause big problems. And then my dad would sit down and have these talks with me and go, look, there are some decisions that if you make them, they could be with you for the rest of your life. Good decisions and bad decisions. Those are mostly around the girl talks when I would talk to dad about that. He's like, watch out for this and watch out for ladies like this, right? Don't smoke, don't chew, don't go with girls who do. Stuff like that that my dad would say. So you had all this information that was out there that they'd give in order for our benefit. These two verses is exactly life skills kind of stuff. Jesus is like, look, you, you have to... To know this, because this is the way that we, we kind of work around um, specifically what we're talking about is sin. Now, when the Bible talks about sin, there are generally three major categories of sin. There's original sin, which we're all born with. You as a person know that. If you, are, if you have little kids, you know they can do bad things without being taught. Amen from the second row. They know it. I know it. Right? You don't have to teach a little kid to be bad. You don't have to teach a little kid to beat up on their little brother or sister either. They just know how to be bad. But being good, you've got to teach them those things. So that's original sin. Everybody has it. It started back with Adam and Eve and it just continues on through the guys. That's what the Bible says. It's passed on through the mail and it just goes on and on and on. Then there's what the Bible calls the sin of iniquity. Those are typically uh, mostly what permeates the American culture. Those are sins on the inside. So iniquity, the sins of iniquity, the things that you think, the, the eternal lusts and desires that you have on the inside. So it's not an action. It's just you think it. Remember when Jesus said if you wish someone was dead, that's like killing them already? So murder in your mind is the same as murder with your hands in Jesus' book. So he's just telling us those are the sins of iniquity. Like, oh, I wish, you know, this were there. Then there's the sins of transgressions. Right? Those are, that's the act of rebellion we do against God's word. Right? The, you see that in the uh, Father, uh, in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us this day, our daily trespasses. Forgive, us, forgive those who trespass against us. Or maybe the debts, forgive those, our debtors. And all that. So when you talk about transgressions, the Bible will call that the things you actually do against God's word. And those are the three general major categories of sin. But sin always, all sin, except for original sin, always starts with temptation. 
right? To do, that's where it starts with. That's, that's the playground. That's the, the buffet bar that can grow into and fill your plate um, full of sin. So let me give you some really good life skills news, some really good encouragements with the one thing about sin. You can be sin free through Christ in me. Now I put it in first person because you need to take this with you. Because here's what's going to happen. Temptation is going to come and you're going to need to overcome that temptation. So that it doesn't grow into or become actual sin. And it is possible to suffer less and less because of sin. Now we're, we're all going to suffer. So I'm not painting some sort of, you know, Disney World unicorn, roses, um, everything gets solved in a half hour episode of your life kind of gospel. That's not the truth. You're still going to suffer. But, but what is true is you can actually suffer less and less because of sin, because of Christ that's in you. So, so we give you this one thing. You just go, look, I'm going to be sin free through Christ in me. That starts with salvation first. If you've never confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and never believed in your heart that God raised you from the dead, you will always get crushed by sin. It will trash your life. It may take um, one week, one year, two decades, but eventually the truth comes out and it's just going to destroy whatever's there. Usually it starts with the relationships, uh, but it can also start in circumstantial things like your job and your neighborhoods and, and all that stuff. In fact, we see that most of the great um, civilizations that existed crumbled in world history from within. The empire that's ruling at the time of Jesus wasn't conquered by some great overwhelming force. What really brought it down was its immorality and sin that it gave into from the inside. And then that eventually collapsed the Roman Empire. So when we talk about this sin, it's possible. But you know what? It, it, you, you are going to have to suffer a little to overcome that. And, and, and maybe more. And let me say this too about when we talk about salvation. You will not win the war against sin by sheer willpower. And I know that's hard for Americans to understand, right? Because we're the bootstrap country. Right? You just, this is where you can go and you make something of yourself. People die on boats trying to get to our country because there's too many people on the boat because they want to get to where they can have freedom to do what they need to do. But you can't through sheer willpower. You might win the battle for a minute and go, oh, I defeated it. But you're going to need the power of Jesus Christ to overcome sin, to, to find the, the freedom that really comes from that. You need his strength. That's why the one thing is sin free through Christ in me. Now, Christ has defeated sin and death. The scripture tells us that. Easter, his death, his resurrection. So imagine for a moment not having to suffer because of the sins of original sins that we're all born with. The sins of iniquity that, we, that our thoughts and our emotions betray us. Or, or the sins of transgressions because we do things against God's will. That that can less and less and less, the longer and longer you live for the Lord, become something that, that isn't as much of an issue in you. I mean, that's, that's the world that we can live in, your world and in your environment. So I would say, if you're not a Christian, no chance to be free from sin. You can't, because there's no other name under heaven in which men may be saved but Jesus Christ. So if you're here today and you're not a Christian, this is easy. You don't even have to pray about this. This is just what you need. Salvation. That's how you can begin to live truly free. Truly free now. But let me give a little context here to just kind of bring this home. Who you live for will determine the intensity of your suffering and joy. Who you live for will determine the intensity of your suffering and your joy. I mean, just think about that. Think about when you put um, hopes and dreams in, in someone else, right? Um, what they call the A-frame relationships, where in the relationship is an A-frame, you're holding hands, but you're always leaning on that person. And there's no joy without the leaning on that person. When that person's gone, you just fall down. Your intensity of suffering and joy is tied to who and what you live for. So you have to answer the question, who am I living for? Because it's only going to be up there as much as you can. In my house growing up, my dad was a disciplinarian. And, and my mom was the one that got us out of trouble the most. So when you f saw yourself veering to dad's death and destruction, you quickly ran to mom's salvation. Because if mom spoke on your behalf, what happens? You got off the hook. There was no paddling and groundings because mom spoke. 
But boy, man, when mom was against you, it's over. Might as well be uncreated because you're just like, now they're both against me. There's no hope. But you also, when you tie yourself um, to joy in that face, you guys know what it is. Have you ever got a Christmas present that you wish you didn't show on your face you wanted to return? (laughs) You're just like, again, socks, aunt, really? I have socks. I haven't even put the ones on you got me last year. And you're like, oh, this is such a bummer. Right? I even gave you a list. I printed out the locations and the cost. Gave you what I wanted. Nothing. So you know when you tie your joy to people that that can wane too. Right? So, so who you're living for and what you're living for will always determine the intensity of your suffering and your joy. So when people let you down, but what does Jesus say? I'll never leave you or forsake you. So your, so your joy can always be high. It's not that you're always going to feel great and your emotions are going to run high, but your joy level can be unaffected by circumstances. I've, I've met some of the most joyous people that I've ever met are those dying in the hospital bed as a Christian about to go to heaven. Those are some of the happiest people I've ever met. Some of the happiest people I've ever met are those who lost their job. Joyous people who have lost their job, but they know that God is going to take care of them because he's got something for them. Sick kids, they trust in the Lord. Not knowing what to do because of the economy, trust in the Lord. So their suffering and their joy is intensely tied to Jesus Christ. This is the, this is the king that has a thousand cattle on a thousand hills. This is the king who died on the cross in our place so that we might live and have the opportunity and respond to salvation. So I am hitching my wagon to that giddy up if I could say that. I am all in on Jesus. I'm like, look, you got to go talk to Jesus. You want to know what to do? Talk to Jesus. You want to know what he wants me to do? Read the Bible and study and find out he wants. So your context of life. So maybe you just look at your suffering and joy and find out, man, no wonder who I'm leaning for is that way and why it's so up and down. So let's look at the scriptures. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 4. Uh, we'll look at just uh, verse 1 here. Uh, since uh, the, maybe, maybe one of the greatest understatements in all of the Bible, right here at the beginning of this verse. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh. <laughs> yeah, he did. Arm yourselves uh, in with the same mindset. I love that. With the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So let's just talk about this for a second. Talk about this for a second. So you always see Peter all the time. And all good Christians are always what? Pointing to Jesus as the example. Like if we could put on a cloak of invisibility and just show Jesus. Or a mirror in front of us and it just shows Jesus. We would totally do that. And that's what Peter's doing. He goes, look, since Christ suffered in the flesh, which he did. What was Jesus' mailing address? Didn't have one. What was Jesus' favorite pillow? The warm side or cool side? Didn't have one. Jesus went without so much. We, do I need to run through Easter again and do the whole Passion Week and the crucifixion and the lashings and the crown of thorns and his beard being ripped out? Dude, sometimes my kids grab my beard just to be funny and it hurts. I couldn't imagine having that thing just yanked out. Spears in the side, nails, dehydration. I mean, all this stuff that he went through. For our sake. So they, Peter's just reminding us. Remember, and he, he's like, look, I was there for a lot of it. You've got to arm yourself with the same kind of thinking. Why was Jesus doing that? Remember the garden? Not my will, Lord, but your will be done. He's, he's literally sweating blood droplets. Because he's so intensely focused on the will of God. So as that takes place and as that's going on, he goes, arm yourself with that kind of thinking. That's what I love. That, this is a manly verse. Right? Arm yourself with that kind of thinking. Get the armor on. I'm doing this. I'm going to my work. I'm going to my worship. I'm going where I live. I'm going where I have fun. Armed with this thinking. If my flesh has got to suffer so someone else draws closer to God, then I'm doing that all the time. I'm going to think that way all the time. How can I go without so someone can go with God? And they're all the time thinking that. And then he, he prefaces it with this last verse. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So this word flesh in this context is also used for like human passions and lusts. Like desires, the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life as the Bible says. And when it says suffering and ceased, those are those who restrain against and don't give in to every whim that they are desired and drawn into. That they're doing that. Because you know the devil's going to do that, right? The world's going to do that. Your flesh is going to want to do that. It's going to want to cry out for you to do this thing. 
And when we think like Jesus and act like Jesus, we can actually begin to overcome that. Because why? The one thing. Sin free because of Christ in me. So you take your salvation and you go, oh man, you know, God wants me, to, he wants me to be strong and he's giving me the strength and the Holy Spirit to do that. Here's the thing that's tempting me and he goes against it, right? He says, no, I'm not because of Jesus. And he has this strength and, and it's really for the encouragement of the greater good that we can ever endure and push forward in these things, right? It's, it's the love of Christ that compels us. That's why people still keep having kids. On, on the face of it, there's nothing really good in return, right? If someone comes up to you and goes, here's what you're going to do. There, it's a lot of crying. It's a lot of poopy diapers. And they're, they're only going to ask for things that they want all the time. Who's going to be like, yeah, let's do that. Can I have that all the time forever? No one's going to do that. But what do they usually say? I don't know about this. But right after that woman has that kid and, and then they look into their eyes and then just God clicks a switch on. Something happens and they're like, yeah, this is, this is worth the no more sleep for the next 18 years. Right? This is worth looking at something and going, we could have name brand hot dogs, but I have so many kids, it's going to be generic hot dogs. That's what we're getting. And Christ says, look, those who suffer in the flesh, those, those who can cease from sin can do that. In fact, uh, a great question is, uh, what does it take to cease sinning? What does it take to just cease sinning? And, and here's what we know from this. It's the heart, mind, soul, and strength of Jesus as modeled in the Bible by maturing Christians. So what does it take to cease sinning? The heart, mind, soul, and strength of Jesus Christ. Because why? Jesus did it perfect. And the Bible tells us he went up against everything. Jesus wasn't walking around with like this huge um, coat of just armor like I am impenetrable to the sufferings of man. Man, that guy wept. He hugged diseased people. He ate with other folks that he got made fun of for being around. They called him fat. They called him a drunkard. They called him the king of demons. And Jesus is all walking around in this life and they're just throwing all this peer pressure on and all this stuff. And he's just walking around sometimes like he didn't even hear their question going, look, the kingdom of God is near. The kingdom of God is near. And he just did everything that way. He's running into in-laws, Peter's in-laws. She's like sick. He heals her. He's setting um, free. Well, what? What, is, uh, what do we learn from the resurrection story? Mary Magdalene had like seven demons in her and he cast those out of her. I mean, Jesus is doing stuff. Why? For their good so that they might be saved and so that they might know Jesus. Talks to the woman at the well. She's um, trading certain favors for rent so that she can live in this house and the man she's with is her husband she's with five others and Jesus just goes right up to her it's like can you give me a drink of water so Jesus knows what it is to suffer tempted by the devil all the time right read the stories of 40 days and 40 nights of him fasting and then the devil tempts him do you really think that's the only time the devil came around like well that was my best shot I'm done I'm gonna leave him alone till he dies no Man, you, we can't imagine how much the devil was just on Jesus every day and every moment. Convinces one of the twelve to betray him. Everybody else runs away but John. He's the only one with the other three moms at the crucifixion. And he's like, look, man, when you suffer in the flesh, you're going to be able to, to resist sin because the power of God is in there. And you go, you know what? This isn't godly. This isn't biblical. This isn't Christian. And through the power of Jesus Christ, I can live this way. I can follow his example and he'll help me through. He'll help me through. Look at verse 2. Look at verse 2. So you're arming yourself, right? So you're like, all right, now what am I going to do with this? Like, a, like an eight-year-old with a hand, hands full of water balloons. Somebody's getting it. Because a water balloon is made to be thrown and bursted upon someone. Probably a sibling if you're in my house. So they're like, well, okay, now you're armed. Look at verse 2. Look at verse 2. Just knowing that the, the temptation doesn't have to grow to sin is so great. And so great. Verse 2. So, as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. So, the, the great question for the day that we already talked about, what do you live for? Who do you live for? Is it money, power, and pleasure? Influence? A sweet vacation? Kids? Spouse, yourself, you just get to look at it because that's the question there. You're arming yourself. Now verse 2, what are you living for for the rest of your time on this planet? Before we all stare at your gravestone if you go before us, 
What are you living for? What's your great purpose? What's your great calling? What's the eternal impact that you're having? Because you're having one, an impact for hell or an impact for heaven. You're having one now by the way in which you live in the places where you work. Where you live. So in this it goes, that's why I love those two little words, live for, for the rest of your days. You can just see Peter going, look, I denied Jesus three times. I got so fired up about him going that I almost cursed at him because he was asking me how much I loved him. I just got so agitated at Jesus. Could you imagine sitting with Jesus around a campfire eating fish? And he's like, do you love me? And you just get so mad at Jesus. And then you're just like, do you know I love you? You know it. And he's the same guy. He's like, look, no longer for human passions. I did that. Man, I got afraid and I ran away and I sold Jesus out in his deepest and darkest time. But not anymore for the will of God. And those are your only two options, by the way. You only have two choices. Self-gratification or God's glorification. We know we exist to bring God glory and make disciples. What is it to bring God's glory? That he gets praise and credit. How's that going at your job? How are your neighbors thinking? Maybe you're here for vacation because it's Memorial Day. Have you let your hair down and let Jesus away a little bit? Because you're like, no one really knows me here at the campground. I just do what I want, say what I want. Run around on the island, do it. How are things going and what you're living for? Because you're either living for Christ and God and Holy Spirit or you're not. There's no other options. And remember, Jesus is trying to life skill the heck out of this going, look, your temptation doesn't have to go to sin. In fact, your temptation doesn't even have to get a hold on you. Imagine just living completely free from the power of those things. I'll tell you what, you can talk to any mature Christian in this room and they'll tell you, it's awesome. It is so great to not struggle with some of the sins and temptations that I did when I was in my 20s. It's so great to just know God's got that under control. I bet it's so hard sometimes to work at those sins and temptations that I'm still working on. But you knew who helps me overcome? It's Jesus. I'm like, man, I can't do this. I don't know. I can't just willpower myself into this. I need your sovereign plan at work in my life. And he goes, here, this is what will bring you through. These people can help you. This family will help you to move in that. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. Maybe you've forgotten this, but th this verse is inside here. Just to give you a perspective of what's going on inside of you. So you don't feel like you're a crazy person when it comes to overcoming this. So in uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, it says this, Beloved, which I always love, right? I just, I love to know that that is a name that God has for us and Jesus has for us. Beloved. Isn't that just nice? Just, you are beloved by him. And he says, I urge you as sojourners and exiles. This isn't where we're going to spend our eternity. Amen? We're not, thankfully. So as sojourners and exiles, I urge you to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. This is what's happening in you every single day. You're not in your perfect body and perfect form yet um, because as a Christian until you move into eternity. So right now, every day that you wake up, every moment that you sleep, your passions, um, um, some translations say the lusts of your body are always waging war against your soul. It just is. It wants you to give in and give up and just push God to the side. And Jesus says, you don't have to. Did Jesus ever give in? No. Did he ever give up? No. Was he fully God? Yep. Was he fully man? Oh yeah. When Jesus ate stinky cheese, you could smell it on his breath. That's how real Jesus is. And now he sits in the right hand of God and goes, look, it's possible. I've given you the Holy Spirit. I've given you all that you need to not let the passions and things go. Are sweet vacations bad? No. Are doing good things for people that you love, like your kids, your spouse, bad? No. But when those things go into something more important than what God is, then that causes problems. Why, why are our human lusts an enemy to our soul? Why is that? Because they seek to replace or come equal to, come equal to God's will for our life. That's the thing. That's how the devil convinced the angels in one of his many dissertations to them to betray God in heaven and side with him. I mean, could you imagine that conversation and that temptation? You're literally a created angel by God. You're there in heaven with God. The devil rolls up to you and goes, look, we can take this guy down. 
We can be in charge of all this. We can determine what happens to creation and, it's, and, and the rest of things that happen. And a third of those guys bought into that. Took that temptation that he laid before them and said, Yup, we're going to do that. That sounds good. That's, that's my way. I, I want to be in charge. I want to do what's best. And then what did God do? Nope. <laughs> that ain't happening. Throws him down. Third of the angels gone. We even talked about last week, who's in charge of all the angels and demons? Jesus. Who's in charge of all the powers and authorities and evil rulers in this world? Jesus. So, your hope to be sin free, not temptation free, because that doesn't happen until heaven, but what a glorious, can you imagine that? <laughs> Living in heaven and no temptation. Just none. You know what? I think I will eat 25 chocolate chip cookies. It doesn't even matter. I'm just going to eat them. I ain't going to get fat. Got a new body. Doesn't happen that way. Right? But just imagine that. No more temptation. But we're not there yet. So we got some life skills and some spiritual stuff that we need to do. This is discipleship, everyone. This is helping them, to, uh, our neighbors and ourselves, to find their way to Jesus. To go, look, we already know every person on the planet, their flesh is warring against their soul. They're being enticed and called and beckoned to give in like a siren song of the ocean. Just give in. It'll be worth it. But sin always costs more than you're willing to pay. And it'll always take more than you ever wanted to give. And some things it just, you can't undo. So though temptation is always there, there's always redemption and forgiveness. Those things still exist. So just remember 1 Peter 2, um, 11. As those things take place, don't let anything replace or come equal to God's perfect will for our lives. Your created purpose to bring God glory and to make disciples. It'll change your job. It change your marriage. It'll change your dating relationships. It'll change how you raise kids. All for the better. Because that temptation will never go. Right? Resist the devil and he what? He flees. Not because you're so great, but because Jesus is so awesome. That's why he does it. So based on this message, what, what can we do? What can you do to bring God glory and make disciples? So, so this, what I'm doing is I'm handing out water balloons. Here's some for you, and here's some for you. And I'm giving you tools based on these scripture verses to be able to, to lock in on how can I live the truth of this sin free through Christ in me. So let's talk about your gospel-centered worship for a second. This, this command is to arm yourself with the mind of Christ. I'm telling you, the more you can think about the world the way Jesus does, it's just going to help so much. So arm yourself with the mind of Christ. That's straight from the scriptures right there in verse 1. What does the Bible say Jesus would think, say, and do? Then what do you do? Think, say, and do that. I mean, that's how it is. You, and you already know this. You all have traditions in your home that you do at holidays, right? You, you all have ways that when your family's growing up, you just did it that way. You know, why do we make our pancakes that way? Why do we cut our cake that way? Why do we celebrate this event that way? It's just because of how you learned it, just the way it was. So humanity already knows what it is to, to learn the good way from someone else and then, and then to mimic and to model that for others. And that's what arm yourself with the mind of Christ is. You're just, you're getting prepared. Man, I'll tell you this. The worst time to prepare for temptation is when you're in the middle of it. That is the worst, right? You're trying to stop smoking. The worst time to try to start smoking is when that's about to hit your lips. That is the worst time. You want to prepare ahead of time for all that. That's what arming yourself is. You're ready and you're prepared to go out to what happens. Let's talk about gospel-centered community. It's going to sound easier than it is, but through the power of Christ, right, all things are possible, right? Philippians 4.13. So, so I, I would, this I would just simply say to you, which is, which is the word here, sin less and less. Rely on the power of God to overcome temptation so that it doesn't turn into sin. That's where the battle is, right? So you sin less and less. Temptation's going to come. We already talked about that. But through the power of Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, through God's guidance and direction, you can actually sin less and less. And that's great news. Through salvation with Jesus first and then as you live as a disciple. And you must rely on the power of God. The only reason I don't struggle with some of the things that now that I did in my 20s is because of the power of God and the grace of God at work, right? You guys have heard that phrase there, but by the grace of God I would go. 
It's just by the grace of God and his strength that overcomes. There's nothing about me mentally or physically or internally that would make that victory ever be won consistently except for the blood of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross and his resurrection. So that's where I go. I quote scriptures. I don't put myself in situations I shouldn't be in. All that stuff helps. But it's always my commitment to Christ, like Christ's commitment to God, that helps me to have the strength to do that. So in your community, look, just sin less and less. Rely on the power of God to help you to do it. He can do it in and through you. Trust me. You can see it in scriptures all the time, right? King David, a great example, right? King David sees a woman, wants her, takes her, gets her pregnant, Kills the husband who's in military service to try to hide it. And, but he is known forever as what? The man after God's own heart. I mean, God can redeem anyone. God can rewrite and change. That's what redemption is at any moment. And I just say don't sell God short and don't leave fruit on the vine if that makes sense. When it's all right there to grab. So community, service. Here's a great way. Serve God first and foremost. Some th- good things become bad things um, when they get above God things. Does that make sense? Good things become bad things when they take the place of God things. So what we strive to do is keep God first and foremost. Do his will, not yours, more and more. That's just a great path. God, what do you want me to do here? What should I stay here? My boss is crazy. My employees are crazy. My spouse is crazy. My boyfriend, girlfriend, crazy. What do you want me to do here? And you just serve God first and foremost. What would Jesus' response be to that? Study the Bible. You'll know. Jesus responded to all kinds of people. And then, so that's just a great way um, to serve others. And finally, multiplication, right? That we can work to set people free. String more and more faithful days together. And if you miss a day, start again. Right? There is forgiveness. Right? Jesus died for all the sins. So from our perspective, your past sins, your present sins, and your future ones are all covered by the empty cross and the empty tomb in the man of Jesus Christ and the God of Jesus Christ. So strive at work to string more and more faithful days together. To be faithful to God in those things. To do what he would have you to do. At, in your home place or your neighborhood. To string more and more faithful days together. And if you miss a day or stumble in a day. Just come on back and start again. God's going to be like, no, nah, forget it. He's not going to say that. He's like, welcome. Let's do it. Let's move in. So let's look at the one thing one last time. Because this is, this is, this is the only way. The only way to be sin free is through Christ in me. I put it in the first person because that's something you tell yourself. The next time temptation comes, you might be two steps outside this door. You could be in this room right now. The only way to be sin free is through Christ in me. So you've got to be saved first. So the Holy Spirit comes in and and dwells. And then if you are a Christian, then you've got access to, to the entire arsenal that God has to overcome, right? His word, other mature Christians on the phone, texting, just help me with this. Places to get together and worship and to be together. All of those things are available and access to the family of God, right? And there's so many more. So in Christ, you'll be able to do that.